Hello and welcome. You are watching CFO Playbook by CXO TV. I am Kalpana Singh, founder in GP Data Tech Media Group, and we have Radha Ramanujan, CFO Ashwat by NEXS as our guest today. Radha is an experienced CFO with an impressive portfolio of achievements and a successful track record of over thirty years in the industry. In her current role as CFO of NEXS, Radha has been instrumental in developing and executing strategic initiatives. Structuring deals and raising funds, managing customer and investor relations, and overseeing the merger, demerger, acquisition process. She is also proficient in setting up startups, establishing e-commerce for lifestyle products, hypermarket business, and F&B industry, as well as setting up manufacturing plants, distributors, and retail networks. In this CFO playbook, we will explore Radha's journey in the industry. Her experiences working in multicultural organizations and how she has established cross-functional partnerships to turn around companies. As we learn from her expertise, we will gain insights into the strategies and techniques CFO can use to maximize their impact in this world. A very warm welcome to you, Radha. Thanks, Kalpana. Nice meeting you as well, and thanks for the good interaction as well. Yeah. Okay. So rather to uh, begin up, you know, uh, we would like to know more about what challenges you have faced while working in multicultural and various organizations. Company has a different way of working. Uh, their priorities will be di different, and even in the industries, a uh, retail and when was in a startup, you should about growing top line. So much getting and profitability, but when you get into a same startup in an evolved company from the day one, the profitability comes into questions. You know, you have to grow profitably, not grow and then make profit. So yes, English used to be understanding the culture and understanding the expectation of the parent, but then it was so far easy going. Yeah. So, what experiences do you have had in developing business models and as getting them into strategic initiatives? See, I my experience, you know, I have worked in a very large corporates like Reliance, Landmark Group, even early stages Wipro, ITC. But everywhere, you know, it it was like a startup experience, even in. A uh, very very early stage when I was in Wipro, that was a time they were trying to create a software as a services type of a company. Wipro was more uh, peripheral, you know, printer manufacturing and then doing distributorship for Apple Mission in thirty years back. So it was like a startup experience for me there. Similarly, when I moved to Arvind Mills, we set up a garment factory. You know, starting from getting the basic license to set up a factory to make it as a big brand. Again, a startup experience. Even FMC, it's a globally four billion dollar company, but in India, we started with a small boardroom where six of us were sitting. You know, borrowing some space from Raleigh's and then set up a company, uh, scaled it up. Reliance, all of you know, is the largest conglomerate in India. But in retail, when I joined in Reliance Prince, I was the first employee in finance and the CFO. You know, work with the business leaders, strategizing how the Apparel business is going to go up. How do we set up stores? Where do we set up warehouses? What do we use SAP or various other software applications? So everywhere, apart from my experience in Chaipan, which really is a startup, where I had to manage raising funds, you know, get the bankers to fund. Rest of the organizations, I started with them and grew them to be a. Uh, Multi billion dollar companies. Proud to say, FMC kept acquiring companies in India. Reliance, well, you know, Reliance retail progress in the last decade. So it's a, a great learning for me. And to move early stage helps a lot. So you can put the process what you feel like instead of getting into some mess and then try to resolve it. From the beginning, you can make it good. That's what I felt in my experience. So uh, specifically, though, you know, we really uh, find very less of the women in 
in CFO role, <laughs> like finance is something I think uh, similar to what technology, right? Uh, women women are less keen at adopting this. So, uh, and especially, you know, you, you said that at Chai Point, uh, uh, you got an experience of raising funds, which was your responsibility. So, uh, uh, if you can elaborate on it, what about that experience like uh how was it and uh, how you did it okay uh you know my first two ticket experience you know, predominantly i moved in as an early stage but still there is a big daddy backup was there you know, parent support did it i raised a lot of funds or debt funds primarily but still the bankers had some confidence it's not that they have given money for rata or, or ability as a cfo but somewhere some backup was there. But Chai Point was really new experience for me. Even I wanted that in my career. I was missing the, you know, the so-called private equity venture capitalist. Even in the CFO forums, I I tend to be a little taking a side back when people talk about they raised money equity win. And I thought it will help my uh, professional knowledge. And the second thing is Chai Point was not a very early stage start. We did have a business model and established 70, 80 stores and it was a successful business model with three business division. One is vending machine, one is restaurant, another one is a technology division. So I thought it is very appropriate for me to get in. More importantly, the founder was also um, very evolved, educated. He is a Harvard alumni. So that way the team members were all very young and vibrant and it perfectly suited my aggression or ambition. Uh, initially new experience because I used to be very uh, fact oriented on the base type of a CFO. Of course, in the startup, when you want to develop business model, you need to have a much larger bird's eye view of what is going to happen, not restricted to this year, next year, next year, and developing a business plan for 10 years and understanding the business from third party, from competition, from the market. All that was a new experience uh, and since I like to take up new challenge, generally I get slightly bored after three years in any company and, and all my career, my bosses kept giving me new challenge. Even Reliance Retail, I started trends, then footprint, home and living. I also took over a little bit of IT. So that way, challenges kept adding. So this was something which was in my blood to learn new things and someone like Amalik made me do whatever I feel like, you know, uh, we got into established banks like Kotak and East Bank to start giving loans for us instead of just going through the venture debts, which was very expensive. And a great learning, and I know I, I cherish that learning even now, even after my retirement, probably if I do a startup, I learned something for which I was paid. That's what I can say. Okay. Okay. So, how have you been able to successfully turn around companies? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, the one thing is experience and working with large corporate helps to replicate the good practices. You know, whichever company, I would say FMC is amazing in terms of finding new ways of doing business legally and ethically. I want to save excise duty, I want to save customs duty, but what are the best methods available? Pick that up, develop over it. And I had a um, good opportunity to work with great consultants like KPMG, DB Desa. So not only my boss's knowledge, I also pick up the knowledge from the consultants who I work with. So that exactly helped me when I moved to Reliance. Why do you need to set a factory to make garments? How can we make things not violating any rules and regulation, but economical and commercially viable? So that way, I would see even when I went to Chai Point, uh, the initial focus for Amalik is I can raise funds, but I want you to put in a process and systems. You've been scaling companies from 0 to 2,000, 0 to 4,000 per company. I want you to scale up my company, build the process around it. Now, we are an evolved company. I want experience CFO. That is what his vision was. Yes, I did manage the procurement, put in a lot of processes, we moved from the legacy system got into Oracle type of accounting software, a structured finance supply chain procurement team. All that helped me. And side by side, yes, the fundraising was also a good experience. 
So knowledge and experience has always helped me to succeed in my next career. Yeah. So knowledge and experience we can understand, but there would be some strategies that uh, you must be using to structure deals and raise funds. So if you can share those strategies, you know, <laughs> that will be quite insightful for the uh, budding CFOs. <laughs> strategy, you know, we cannot apply one single strategy for all companies. That is very important. You know, what type of the company you are in, what type of the product you are in, and what is the appetite for the founder or the promoter to dilute his capital. All this is a mixed strategy. And then, okay, I have a strategy, but is there availability of fund in this? Even in, in my chai point experience, when we did you initially we wanted to go for a little higher CDC. But later on, business was profitable. Within one year of uh, I moving there, I could report a profit instead of you know any other startup company laws. It's a profitable business. Every single stores were profitable. The unit economics were good. Then your strategy changes. Right? Why should I dilute? I go to bank borrowings, retain maximum shareholding with me. Wherever possible, go for debt funds and not for equity funds. But I'm also part of the IPV, you know, where we keep evaluating few startups and other. But if someone is coming just with an idea, a great idea, but expecting I will not dilute my equity, you know, I want borrowing, I will hold 90 percent holding, that doesn't work. In an idea stage, initiative stage, yes, you need to dilute more. But when your idea starts working, be careful, not let loose your holding completely and slowly and steady. The second thing I would also say is when the money is available, we should pop it. You can always say, right now I need only X, maybe tomorrow I will need Y. The one thing which has happened is the pandemic. Right? If things bear good, uh, probably Chai Pai would have seen the IPO by this time. But for the pandemic, things just got delayed. So similarly, we do not know what is going to happen in future. If money is available, yes, take it. But don't dilute it too much and don't try to be greedy. That is also another one. Some founders I have seen when I evaluate the pitch document, extremely greedy. With just initiative, the valuation they expect is like 10 times, 5 times. And they don't even get it to experimenting. So it's a mix of many things. One strategy I would say cannot be just passed on to another company. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, I was about to talk about COVID and uh, you, you just said contact. So, uh, you know, what are your observations uh, during all this period pre-COVID, during COVID and now, you know, it's a quite of a new normal that we are always talking about. We are in uh, still, you know, uh, I think uh, it's the remote work which is going on almost. So, uh, how it has uh, affected the finance and uh, particularly, you know, your observation as a CFO, if you can make any comparisons or with the instances like you have given one of for the Chai point. So, also in terms of, uh, you know, the government policies uh, being changed during this period, starting from, you know, introducing GST. So, uh, you were also talking about uh, the best practices, uh, uh, big one you know CFO can think of uh, without having a uh, getting into any illegal thing. so when it comes to duties and taxes you can uh, share some insights see during COVID I was uh, working with Ashitpa our business was into piping segment uh, we faced challenges and we had opportunities as well the challenges which we faced was we are a or oh, a traditional manufacturing company, 25 year old manufacturing company with large labor force. Initially, we couldn't believe that we can work remotely. Our sales team, you know, they need to connect with the distributors, dealers, get the orders. The factory has to be running continuously. And all of us were a very important morning to evening in the office. But we realized during COVID, the necessity makes us think differently. We came with a lot of innovative ideas. We have factory, we have facilities. How can we make it useful for the society, useful for the economy? Uh, we started manufacturing sanitizers. 
we made oxygen concentrators and supply to our distributors you know that that was uh, even government side i would say the approvals and licenses which we got even the novel approval license takes two months inspection we applied because sanitizer is little hazardous not it right up they gave license we manufactured it supplied to many hospitals supplies to give to employees free sent it to our distributor partners uh, the oxygen concentrator we had an r&d lab which was supposed to be doing innovation around piping and allied products but making you know oxygen cylinder was something out of our regular thinking but we could do that and the way we were doing sales during the period remotely that also gave us a lot of confidence we can do things digitally we can automate many things the traditional mindset went out and then we started investing heavily on technology transforming sales force uh the sad part happened for us was the volatility in the product price the raw material which we import raw material which we consume the prices initially kept on going and then it kept on coming down we had supply chain disruptions transport shipping cost was going substantially high and my end customers were not able to absorb that so beyond that the slow down in the general economy you will understand you know when there is a pandemic not much construction activity happened and followed by pandemic the job loss again people were holding on to their money so or dent in the real estate progress some reduction in the demand slightly affected us but that covid period gave a lot of time for us to think completely differently we repurposed our factory we introduced so many new products and we feel happy now okay that was an opportunity for us actually we thrived on that opportunity absolutely so covid brought a lot of opportunities also so i i guess still uh, uh, you are on with uh, manufacturing the oxygen cylinders or uh, you know it was been uh, stopped after the acute covid rise period we stopped that because there is no demand uh, many organization you know including bl ongc those type of large corporates were also getting into manufacturing that and fortunately in india after that april may 21 you know to the death on account of shortage of oxygen cylinders came down and doctors have also found out we to attack the second or third wave of covid so that need has come down so we stopped reducing that okay so you were talking about a uh, lot of technology implementation during that period so uh, what all initiatives been taken at that time uh, you know in terms of technology about adoption and uh, which you think you know got uh, an roi or uh, also you know while executing this uh, uh, implementing these technologies what were the challenges and uh, now moving forward you know uh, what what are the plans like what will be on the priorities uh, moving forward in terms of uh, spent you know investment in the technology um see uh, like any other company we were investing on technology but after pandemic our investment has accelerated you know and it is not just in automating process for uh, for right decision we are also investing on capital improvements you know technology is automating process that can you know help reduce manual errors or um, in the factory side the lot of automation which we are doing for example the qr codes tracking advanced tracking to see where my pipe is going uh, we have spent a lot of money on our data analytics and the other thing is distributor management system how do i see the pipe which we are manufacturing here how it travels through this uh, you know, ecosystem and where it is landing up we we spent a uh, digitizing and our distributors will be using the distributor management system which is also getting cascaded to the dealers 
and we also have an application for the plumbers. Plumbers are the end users of a product. Uh, so a lot of investments we have made in the supply chain process, not just improve machinery which can you know produce much more quality product with less pollution and other things. But from accounting side, manufacturing side, sales side, everywhere we are now digitized. Uh, I would rather say we are transforming the way we are working. Yeah. So, uh, any challenges that you faced implementing all these technologies? The initial challenge uh, continued to be there, right? Adaption and uh, some resistance from the field workforce because it it gets them to a lot of discipline in the way they are doing the work. It, it gives us a lot of transparency. We are able to track many things seamlessly. So a bit of resistance that we got over. The next level of resistance came from the distributor partners. You know, We also get to know how they are selling, to whom they are selling, when, what, what is this store, to an extent of transparency. While that actually helps them to see their inventory, it helps us to see their inventory and send the material back faster. But the traditional minds and initial resistance on open up everything to the company was there. But we got over it and then uh, we are making good progress on that. So any, uh, you know, practices you would like to share uh, in terms of this change management? So the change management happened like an organization drive. You know, it. It was not taken like only the sales team will drive for a sales force transformation. The whole organization went behind, including the CEO who was, you know, tracking the progress and then ensuring things happen. So a particular division cannot get into the transformation. I think the whole support from the organization, including support and investing on, you know, money. Yes, I'm doing business as it is. Why should I spend? crores of rupees on getting something automation and it's very difficult to calculate ROI immediately yeah. the people behavior change how do you measure it in money terms but it definitely gives over a period of time your ROI so somewhere any major transformation has to be driven by the I would say the CEO of the company and supported by everyone if there is no buy probably it will get stuck in the way of implementation and it may become a negative ROI or it just becomes expenses for the company. But for us, since it was taken up passionately by everyone in the organization, we are making a good progress. So it's really good to see that you are a CFO who believes too much in technology now. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, I've been uh, having uh, these kind of candid chats with the CIOs as well. And, uh, you know, wherein they have highlighting the challenge that uh, it's tough to get the budgets. <laughs> Although, you know, I, I've always <laughs> said, I, I never said no to IT budget is people and IT both. I strongly believe people can contribute to the company if they are reasonably well motivated. And IT will help you scale. Otherwise, every time my team comes with additional manpower, the first push is how do we automate? Anything yeah. has to be automated, only something which cannot be automated. And with the chat GPI, even thinking has become automated. <laughs> right? That is where a life is becoming. So unless you question yourself, it cannot be automated, then don't look out for people. So I am being a little naked. I think that I don't give people so easily. But yeah. yes, uh, the way I have in my previous companies, especially Reliance, I would, I still Thank to them, the number of team members I had when we were not even having a single store, I completed the same number of team members when we were reaching close to 4,000 crore turnover. But yes, the company spent, like at least for my vertical, we spent substantial amount on, you know, what we call this DSS, decision support system. Investment in IT, initial investment and process, which has scaled. So that was a great learning for us and I keep insisting everyone to spend time on process and IT. IT will help you to scale. People will definitely help you. But at some point of time, that itself will be a hindrance for scale. 
yeah so uh, uh you know how have you gone about setting up the standard operating procedures and what have been your experience in implementing erp systems and uh, uh, absolutely you know while while deciding to the vendors what are the key things you know uh you of course i mean this region is being taken care by the uh, technology heads the leaders basically but being this cfo uh, you also must be having that uh, uh, view considering that why and getting the budgets that uh, you know how how the budget has to be allocated of course you know in technology automation is important in manufacturing but it is the major issue this uh, at this part of time so uh, your it budgets you know how are you allocating in terms of uh, you know giving a certain amount of budget for automation and uh, bifurcating it with the security also considering the cyber security as well so if you can throw some light so in my current company uh, safety comes at the top most even the uh, global ceo has said there's nothing like a budget you need for safety even once when i asked him you know, can we increase the safety budget so that people spend more for that and he said you should not even have a budget for safety spend if it is required it has to be spent security is a must for the company cyber security is a must this need not be you know he didn't even like the phrase budget it should not even restricted with the terminology called budget these are important safety and health is important especially in a manufacturing sector for the people so it needs to be spent security is important because we are growing company we keep growing we are scaling up we can't have you know cyber breach and then data leakage or anything it need not be just leakage but it can even stop the way we are progressing so these two for me the actual sum my budget that is how if people have time and energy to spend for it yes they spend it sometimes yes we couldn't spend because it also requires people it also requires time to implement beyond that safety security there is absolutely no stoppage for that and i i strongly believe this even when i worked in fmc it was a nasdaq listed company first thing when any time when we give a large capital project for it is first it start with safety how safe is the plant how safe is the worker and then comes what do you do how do you produce what is the return on investment on the cap when safety security is slight problem even if it is a 30 to 40 percent roi we just say no to the project so that that is somehow come into my blood also wherever it's happening beyond that like i said i strongly believe in it so I never said no to it budget but that doesn't mean we have to spend wrongly if something is available at x cost we don't want to give y cost just because budget is available if there is a need need better be addressed through it because it is for long term and again it budget doesn't mean we need temporary solutions if it's spending money for a temporary fix is not what i would prefer but if there is a long term solution which is not going to disturb my core erp then i'll fight for that yeah okay so uh, you know uh, with an increase in capital expenditure on infrastructure investment by 33% and uh, budget 23 uh, has significantly increased its focus on the infrastructure industry how is it expected to impact the overall sentiments of the piping system i think segment i okay so in india if we have to rise to the ranks of the uh, global powers and reduce poverty we definitely need to grow faster uh, recently i was listening last saturday with the fm speech in bangalore and mr nilesh gupta was telling how we were the strongest economy till 1800 we were number one number two and then after the invasion we started collapsing okay and if we have to again get back to number one number two position then the only thing is out in personal infrastructure so the wise thing in 2002 and 2003 budget government has allocated a lot of money for infrastructure and uh, for us as the investment in infrastructure increases uh, we believe there will be a corresponding increase in demand for bikes and related products which are essential for uh, various construction projects like building roads bridges and any other infrastructure not only that if 
the infrastructure set up it also creates the a related development right the housing society will develop over that so offices will come industries will come educational institution so it will translate into higher direct revenues for us and so any increase in infrastructure spent by government i feel it will directly and the piping industries as well yeah so so but uh, the macroeconomic parameters of 2023 are not at their best with the years of recession and ongoing war declining markets so in this scenario besides layoffs and cost cutting measures organizations are really looking at their financial and uh, uh, spending management strategies so what are the changes uh, you are seeing in this The one is yes, the recession. Another thing, are they impacting us heavily? I won't say so much, but the volatility in the raw material which we are buying is impacting our business. You know, people who are constructing, they are waiting. Okay, the prices keep falling down. Let us wait. Maybe another month it will fall down. Another month it will fall down. So that way, the demand has slightly become sluggish for us. The second thing is because of unseasonal rain, our uh, agri business has become, you know, challenging for us. We are not getting into any austerity mission or anything, so we have not been impacted that much. Yes, we we had an aggressive growth plan, slightly getting impacted because of the price volatility. So we are investing on people. We are investing on capital expansion. We are investing on technology. One of the things is we are investing wisely. We are not getting into cost-cutting measures at this point of time. But effective spending, effectively monitoring the cost, is what we are into now. Yeah. So that visibility on cost uh, is really important. Yes, visibility on cost. We have a lot more way to understand how my capex is going. What is the progress of it? Where it is? Start how it is? And what is the right thing to in and when do we bring in people when do we bring in technology so the cost is getting incurred but uh, i would say we become effective in spending so last but not the least what are the latest trends which are going to redefine this segment and what is the outlook for the industry for the next three to five years oh uh, the latest trend is like all the piping manufacturers are investing heavily on technology Uh, while I I say I'm investing, I also keep hearing uh, from my competition how they are spending money on technology. The next thing is on sustainability. Sustainability to say, uh, immediate and long term. Uh, we are spending a lot of money on uh, green power. I won't say spending. We are investing a lot of money on uh, zero emission projects, recycling waste. So we have certain, uh, you know, metrics on sustainability which we track that also include something like a gender diversity, which I will say is a part of the sustainability metrics. So with ten fifteen strong metrics, and we are aiming to grow in a sustainable manner. So our aim is to provide water, quality water. It where our water flows. We need to be there. We are expanding beyond five. We launched a water tank. We are entering into the product of the wall segment. We are penetrating into the adjacencies. So we would say uh, from overhead tank to you know STPs, underground water tank or the sewage tank. We are present everywhere, and we are expanding. That's that's very really nice. <laughs> hey, all right. So uh, I think uh, with this uh, brings us to the end of this conversation. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. And in this episode of CFO Playbook by Sixth TV, we were able to gain insight into Vara's experiences working in multicultural organizations and how she has been able to establish cross-functional partnerships to turn around companies. 
this has provided us with the uh, invaluable strategies and techniques that CFOs can use to maximize their impact for the business world. Um, in conclusion, uh, Rana's block accomplishments are an inspiration to aspiring CFOs and uh, demonstrate the impact one individual can have on a business. Thank you so much, Radha, for joining. Thank you. Thanks, Kalpana. Thank you. Bye bye. For more updates from CXO TV, please like and subscribe to our channel.